just, I'm assuming you've had this information, so we're going to um, go ahead and continue on. Core pulmonale is a specific type of heart failure due to increased pressure in the lungs. And oftentimes you'll see COPD patients that may have this type of a heart failure, which involves the right ventricle. Um, we're going to really get into heart failure during our next lecture, so I'm not going to spend any time on this one. Um, so you can read this slide. I don't think there's going to be any, maybe one question on core pulmonale, but I'm sure that's going to um, play a bigger role when we talk about heart failure next week. So let's get into our obstructive pulmonary diseases. Um, so probably many of you are familiar with asthma. Um, it is a reversible type of obstructive disease. Um, it is inflammatory. Um, it's a hyperreactivity of the airway. It's reversible. Um, many times people will have recurrent episodes. They might find out they have asthma as a child. Some people can grow out of it. Other people will have it like lung. Some people get it when they exercise. Some people experience asthma symptoms when they are, have illness. Um, but true asthma is more episodic. Um, and when they do experience symptoms, it involves wheezing, which is that high-pitched musical sound when you listen to it. Sometimes you don't even need a stethoscope if it's severe enough. Um, they'll experience coughing, shortness of breath, and probably some chest tightness. Most of the time, triggers are allergens. Um, like I said, it can be exercise, it can be pollutants, it can be um, occupational exposures, having respiratory infections, sinusitis, um, sensitivities to certain drugs or food, um, exposures to cold air or dry air, and even gastric reflux, <clears throat> which is kind of what's doing is kind of aspirating into the lungs, which is the trigger. So this is the pathophysiology map, comes straight out of your textbook. And so you see um, you have the triggers, whatever the case may be. It does have some sort of an immune activation. Mast cells, all of those are inflammatory, causes vasodilation. So if you think of vasodilation happening in the lungs and this increased capillary permeability, what you have is you have fluid migrating into the alveoli. Um, at least into the interstitial sections of the lung. So it's coming out of the vasculature, and it's migrating interstitially, and if it becomes severe enough, it will migrate into the alveoli as well, which obviously oxygen can't get through fluid, so that's going to cause issues with hypoxia. Um, you also have issues of spasming of the bronchi. So the bronchi are narrowing. Uh, so the pathway of airflow becomes restricted. Uh, this vascular congestion occurs, edema occurs. Now we're all talking about the alveoli in the lungs. Okay? Secretion can be manufactured or created in the alveoli. And um, basically it obstructs the patient's airway. Um, so you see... A picture of how this happening is the mucous strands that occur, the swelling of the mucosa causing a smaller air uh, or a smaller pathway for air flow. When that gets occluded by secretions, there's very little room for air to get past. And so these patients will experience increased respiratory rates because of hypoxemia, obviously a sensation of shortness of breath and dyspnea. Um, and so what's happening is we have an effective perfusion. That's the circulatory, that's the blood flowing into the lungs past the alveoli. But they're not onboarding oxygen to the hemoglobin because the oxygen can't get to the, the alveoli in the first place due to the narrowing and the secretion formation. Right? So the body will try to compensate through hyperventilation when it detects that there's a change in oxygen saturation. At first, because of the hyperventilation, people blow off carbon dioxide. That's going to cause them, if you captured that picture in time, their arterial blood gases are going to reflect alkalosis, meaning that their pH is greater than 7.45. 
and they're blowing off CO2, which means their CO2 levels fall below 35. I do not care that you know about ABGs right this minute. We will do a lot of ABG interpretation in MCA3. Okay. Um, and then, of course, all of those changes increase the work of breathing for patients. Air gets trapped. Um, and then also CO2 will eventually get trapped as well. So that's why I said a picture in time, because during hyperventilation, during the initial phases of asthma, they'll be alkalotic. But as the CO2 gets trapped and cannot offload and get exhaled, the patient will transition into an acidotic state, meaning their CO2 levels will now go be above 45. The normal CO2 is 35 to 45. Less than 35 is respiratory alkalosis, and greater than 45 is respiratory acidosis. So this becomes um, typically an emergency for most individuals unless they've had it long enough and they know how to treat it and recognize these changes earlier rather than later. So this is just another picture showing the pathophysiology. So what you see as clinicians, you're going to see somebody in distress. Probably hear them wheeze. Their chest is going to feel tight. Um, it doesn't have, it have to happen in a certain process. I've had patients tell me they feel their chest tight before they ever develop wheezing. And they're asking for albuterol in that case because they've lived with asthma long enough to know um, what it feels like when they start having an asthma attack. Um, their heart rate will go up. Certainly they're going to become anxious because they can't breathe. Their blood pressure is going to go up as well. Um, if they're really working hard, you'll see accessory muscle use, probably shoulders helping them to breathe using their rib cage. You know, it becomes a very significant effort for them to try to um, gasp for air. If their airways start closing off, that's when you don't hear anything at all, and that's really a serious sign of asthma. If we hear wheezing, that's great. At least we know some airways are open because the narrowing is causing that sound. But if that sound disappears and they're still trying to start struggling to breathe, that means their airways are now effectively closed off altogether and they're not going to be able to get any level of oxygen and they're going to deteriorate very rapidly, requiring emergency intubation and ventilation most likely. So your textbook has some classifications to asthma as far as severity is concerned. So I've listed the table here for you to refer to. Um, and then uh, impairment, it just depends on the patients. Um, most patients are taught how to use a peak expiratory flow meter, but every asthma patient that I've ever encountered never uses it. So, um, ivory tower asthma treatment is what I call it. So anyway, looking to see where that slide is. Okay, so that slide's a few slides away for... Um, right now, so I'll show you that. Um, if they have a lot of asthma attacks, their condition's going to be a little bit more serious than somebody who has infrequent asthma attacks. So oftentimes when somebody comes in with a history of asthma, the healthcare provider is asking them, have you ever been hospitalized with asthma? Have you ever, or do you take corticosteroids? Because that could indicate a more severe type of asthma. Have you ever been intubated or placed on the mechanical ventilator? All of those give us ideas about how serious or severe their asthma is for that patient. Um, and we worry more about those individuals. They may ask for a respiratory therapy to come perform lung function tests. So we might ask them to do an exhaled volume. We might ask them to measure the vital capacity uh, for these patients. Ultimately, complications basically lead to respiratory distress and even possibly death. Um, they could go into respiratory arrest depending on how serious their asthma attack is and if they are able 
to either rescue themselves or seek medical attention to um, help reverse the attack. Status asthmaticus is not that common. Uh, however, it is the most serious form of an asthma attack. It is life-threatening, and these individuals uh, deteriorate very rapidly and need very aggressive emergency treatment to um, rescue them. To the point that they may, they if they do need to be paralyzed, which we can do with medications, they will need to be intubated and placed on a mechanical ventilator. Um, and sometimes putting them under sedation or even anesthesia will stop the asthma attack so that they can be treated. But that's a very severe, rare instance. I'm going to skip this. The interventions uh, we'll talk about. Um, this is basically your classification. I believe this comes directly out of your textbook as well. And my screen's cut off. But basically, asthma is really treated as a primary care issue. In other words, outpatient. You typically aren't seeing patients admitted with asthma unless they end up in a serious health crisis or if um, they're being admitted for something else and they have asthma in their history. Um, and again, this dictates mild, moderate, severe, or life-threatening, and then this helps the clinician decide how to manage that patient and in what uh, facility, outpatient versus inpatient, should they be managed. Don't really, you know, do too much with this slide. It's more of an explanation than anything else. So asthma medications, um, there's a variety of them. Probably the most common one is the rescue inhaler albuterol. It's a short-acting bronchodilator. Um, people with asthma should carry, with that, carry this with them at all times. Um, and this is that go-to inhaler that when they feel an asthma attack coming on, they reach for this to treat it. We can uh, give the medication nebulizers in the hospital. So that's what you see in this image up here. If you haven't seen one yet, this is kind of that almost pipe-looking thing. We put the medicine in the canister. We attach this to wall oxygen, and then they breathe in the nebulized or the droplet particles of the... Um, it's usually albuterol medication, but you can also use atrovent um, as well. Um, arrow chambers, some people might be using this because sometimes it's really hard to push a canister down and take that inhalation breath and hold it. You need a lot of coordination to do it. So the arrow chamber allows them to depress the canister, put the medication in the chamber, and then the patient can worry about taking that deep breath and inhaling the medication. So you might see some individuals use the arrow chamber. This picture is basically your, your dry powdered inhalers. Some people might be taking as well. They come in little discs that they take um, dry powder uh, inhalation through. Singular is more of a um, medication to kind of reduce leukotrienes, which are thought to cause asthma attacks. May or may not be on these type of medications. And then the corticosteroids that you see being used in the hospital, such as solumedrol, solucortef, um, they, you may be asked to give the, this medication IV, especially if these patients have been on corticosteroids at home, and we need to, say, take them off of it to go into surgery, and they, so they need to go ahead and give this type of um, medication, or they're coming in through the ER in an attack and we want to give them a corticosteroid that will act very quickly, and so that will be an IV administration. So these are a variety of the peak flow meters. Um, every asthma patient should probably have one, but whether or not they use it is certainly an individual decision. Uh, the idea is that they measure their pulmonary function on a daily basis. So when they are experiencing no symptoms, they should have a baseline to know what their peak flow is. 
And they're to use that as a gauge to know when it's getting worse. So if they know exactly what their peak flow is and they do it on a daily basis, then pretty much they can do anything they want if they fall into that um, 80% of their personal best or higher. That's the green zone. They don't have any symptoms. They can go participate in any activities they want. They're not experiencing any issues. When they get into the yellow zone, basically it's only 50 to 79% of their personal best. And so that's telling them proceed with caution because you are experiencing some symptoms and doing certain activities may exacerbate those symptoms. Um, but it's not necessarily necessary to seek medical attention, even in the yellow zone, they can usually treat themselves. When they get into the red zone, that's where they really need to reach out to their um, primary care physician or if they need to come to the ER. They're very symptomatic. They're at 50% or less of their personal best. And if they don't seek medical attention, they could deteriorate very quickly. Like I said, not many asthma patients use So, uh, but that's the end. Nursing management, so this is in the acute care setting. Obviously, you're going to tailor your physical assessment to respiratory and cardiovascular. Make sure you're listening to their lung sounds. Um, are their wheezes audible? Are they getting less audible? Because that's going to give you an idea of their condition. Are they struggling to breathe using accessory muscles? Their heart rate going up? Are they really anxious? Um, what's their oxygenation saturation? Is that on oxygen? Is it not on oxygen? Um, do I need to report something to the physician to get more medications to give the patient, like maybe a nebulizer treatment? Um, how aggressive are we going to be, basically, is determined uh, based on the assessment of your patient. You may ask respiratory therapy to do some pulmonary function tests. That could be an order that you uh, execute. So getting into COPD, that pretty much wraps up asthma. Um, remember, a lot of our interventions are very much the same for any type of respiratory problem. Okay. Um, <clears throat> trying to optimize their breathing, trying to open up airways if that's the cause of their uh, work of breathing or their increased uh, work of breathing. And then basically managing symptoms, improving oxygenation. So COPD, we know COPD occurs primarily in our smoking patients, uh, people who have been cigarette smokers for years, maybe cigar smokers. Um, it could be an occupational hazard. Maybe they worked in the mine. Maybe they worked around noxious gases or particles. Um, I've known of individuals that were truck drivers, never smokers, but they carried um, very volatile, toxic agents. So those particles and gases they were exposed to on a daily basis, and they ended up developing COPD. So there's a variety of reasons as to why. It could be genetic. You could have um, a patient who it got passed down from their parents as a genetic component, and that's a specific type of, um, I think it's alpha antitrypsin, uh, genetic disorder that they could end up with COPD. And typically that affects your younger uh, patients, your 20, your 30 something. COPD typically is a really reserved to middle age or late in age um, population. This is the pathophysiology, again, comes directly out of your textbook. Uh, so you see whatever particles, gases, whatever the cause is, inflames the airways. Um, it causes over time remodeling, in other words, misshapen alveoli that become less elastic, less able to offload CO2 and onboard oxygen. Um, and so there are some permanent chronic changes that occur in these patients. So normal alveoli kind of look like grapes. That's what's pictured on your left side of your screen. And you see how those grapes change in shape. And so they become less functional. 
in COPD, uh, which is going to cause problems with CO2 trapping and hypoxemia where they cannot um, have that diffusion of oxygen onto the hemoglobin as easily as if you had a normal alveoli. Uh, diagnostics, chest x-rays help. Um, if it is a genetic consideration as to the cause of COPD, they will test the serum alpha-1 antitrypsin level. Um, otherwise, that is not tested. Um, pulmonary function test, doing a six-minute walk test um, to see if the patient has any symptoms with the activity. Doing an arterial blood gas, that's going to really hone in on the CO2 level and the oxygen level for comparison. And then I've given you a questionnaire that patients may be asked um, during their assessment of, C of COPD for a diagnosis. And so if you want, you can click on that and uh, go to that link and see what type of assessment gets done. So there is a severity classification for this as well, and it's GOLD. Global Initiative for Chronic Obstructive Lung Disease. Um, I do not care that you know these levels. You might see them or read about them in people's history. Um, but basically, it's um, based on their forced exhalation volume in one second. And that's through pulmonary function testing. So you get a baseline, and then you get, depending on um, what it is, well, you predict it for the patient, and then depending on what it is, you end up getting mild, moderate, severe. So as it gets worse, obviously, you get down to this, the very severe level at gold four. But again, the only reference I would make to this slide is if you read it in somebody's history of physical and says COPD gold four, then you know how severe that disease is for them. And that's really, for a nursing standpoint, all that I will extract from this information. We don't diagnose, so don't worry about using this to diagnose anybody. Signs and symptoms, um, certainly they have a cough. They're probably going to be probably consistent sputum production. Um, oftentimes, if you do have smokers, you might hear it referred to as a smoker's cough, um, and it sounds very wet or productive. They may wake up coughing in the middle of the night or wake up in the morning um, coughing and maybe even expect to lose Um They may not be able to do some of the activities they used to. They may might be climbing a set of stairs, and that's becoming more and more difficult for them. They become more short of breath. Uh, if they do have sputum, you're going to probably hear that as adventitious breath sounds, and you would document that most likely as bronchi or coarse breath sounds. Um, they may or may not have chest tightness. Um, it depends if they're going to have weight loss or anorexia, but if you're struggling to breathe and you're doing that pretty consistently all day long, you it may affect what you eat because you can't take the time to eat the food because when we eat, we stop breathing. And so if they're struggling to breathe, they may be eating less and less because they can't breathe. Um, they may develop first lip breathing, and that's often to try to expel um, the CO2. So what they're doing is they're lengthening their exhalation time to try to offload some of that CO2 as a compensatory response to that CO2 trapping. As the alveoli change and the air gets trapped, they may get a larger chest expansion. So that's that barrel chest that their chest gets bigger and bigger over time um, with all those alveoli that get misshapen and start trapping air. Um, so COPD can have a crossover of bronchitis and emphysema. And so what they've done is they've uh, taken out, there used to be back in the day, it used to be if you had COPD, you either had emphysema or you had chronic bronchitis. You can have chronic bronchitis without having COPD. So basically the definition of COPD has changed over time. 
Um, so now chronic bronchitis is an independent disease, but you also can see it in COPD, but it doesn't have to be there um, to diagnose somebody with COPD. In order to be diagnosed with chronic bronchitis, the criteria is, is that you have a consistent cough with sputum production three months out of the year for two years straight. So that, that pretty much um, will get you that diagnosis. Emphysema, again, can occur in COP, but it can also occur independently. So it doesn't have to occur in COP. What happens in emphysema is you get a destruction of the alveoli, but it's not fibrotic. So typically when the body has um, injuries to it, it likes to replace it with scar tissue. That's a very fibrotic type of tissue. So what they're saying in this case is this the, the injury to the alveoli, to the tissue, is not being replaced with scar tissue for emphysema. However, you do get a loss of elasticity in the alveoli. So that kind of gives you an idea. What they've done is pulled out the alveoli. The normal ones are at the bottom, right? But the misshapen or the loss of elasticity with emphysema you can see occur with top. Um, what happens with COPD patients in general, with these alveoli that um, become changed and chronically changed, is this tissue can develop into what's called blebs and bulla. The blebs are like air-filled cysts, and you can see that at the top of the screen. They form on the outside of the lung. They can pop, and when they pop and rupture, they can cause pneumothoraces, which may require a chest tube. Um, the bulla are actually at the alveolar level, and basically um, they are usually associated with emphysema, and because they take up more and more room, they're going to displace other healthy alveolar or tissue, so they may have to go in surgically to do wedge resections from the lung and take these uh, changes in alveola out. Okay, so they can reduce the size of the lung surgically and do what's called a, a bolectomy and take them out and remove them. So that's a picture of a bleb under a surgical <laughs> microscope. <Bleb. laughs> and then you can see what normal lung tissue looks like on the right versus what the bulla has done to the size of the lungs. And then, of course, this is the heart. See how drastically that has changed. Okay, so some of the same medications you learned about with asthma are going to be the same ones we use for COPD. The short-acting beta um, adrenergics, the long-acting ones, the um, inhaled corticosteroids, oxygen, um, and then, of course, we talked about some of the surgical therapies that they can do as uh, to reduce the lung size that they need to. In very, very severe forms of COPD, they may need lung transplant, but that is very difficult to get. There's not a lot of donors, um, and there's a higher risk of uh, rejection with lung transplant. Um, you also must have the ability to um, manage the medications that coincide with lung transplantation. You must have the financial resources. Um, so there are certain criteria of whether or not you're going to be a candidate. Um, nursing interventions, again, nutrition. That's going to probably be small meals, multiple times a day because sitting down and engorging themselves, they may not have the energy to eat a large meal. Plus, we know our stomachs get larger. It pushes up on the diaphragm, which may cause issues with their ability to breathe. Um, sexual activity may be affected. If they don't have the lung capacity to be involved in sexual activity, that might be something that is very concerning to the patient. 
Um, certainly stopping smoking. Now, again, you're going to find patients that have COPD that will continue to smoke. Um, it is an individual choice. We can only do so much, but giving them the information and the resources to try to get them to stop will be ideal. Avoid anything that might irritate the lungs or cause some type of bronchospasm. Um, they also might find themselves not being able to engage in certain activities. So finding periods during the day where they've rested, where they can engage in that activity, and that would include sexual activity as well. Um, but they're going to possibly have to take more rest periods. Ideally, we don't want them to confining themselves to their homes and to chairs or beds because they can't participate in activities. That's only going to make things worse. Um, but being able to maybe do a burst of an activity and then rest and then, you know, resume that activity when they regain their strength. A lot of psychosocial considerations, especially if it's um, contributing or interfering with their everyday livelihoods, and then when to seek medical care, which, of course, if um, they're having more and more struggles breathing, medications aren't working, um, usually any signs of respiratory infection could exacerbate their condition. They're going to need to report um, any signs of illness to the patient, just to, I mean, sorry, to the physician, just to make sure they don't get into a serious medical condition. So we talked a little bit about arterial blood gases with COPD patients. So because of the, um, they hold on to CO2, carbon dioxide, there, when we do blood gases on these patients, their carbon dioxide levels are going to become normally abnormal which is going to fall above 45. Typically, you'll find COPD patients that might even have values in the 50 range. That means their pH might be below 7.35 because they're going to be in a constant um, type of acidosis related to their respiratory condition. The body will compensate for that to a degree. Um, so they may not be, you know, they may be in a compensated state, of respiratory acidosis, um, and they also might have lower levels of oxygen, and that becomes their normal as well. So remember, you and I should fall between 80 to 100, but COPD patients oftentimes won't ever reach 80 because of their disease, and they might even be closer to what we consider that critical level of oxygen at 60 or below. They may live there, and that might be normal for them. Some patients do need home oxygen, um, so it will just be, depend on their symptomology whether or not they will need home oxygen. Complications. So because of all of these changes in the lungs, the pressure in the lungs change too, and that's going to cause what's known as pulmonary hypertension. That's going to put an uh, increased workload on the right ventricle. And over time, if the right ventricle is asked to pump against this higher pressure, that ventricle can fail. And that right-sided heart failure related to COPD is known as core pulmonal. Um, COPD exacerbations may warrant hospitalization, certainly acute respiratory failure will, will as well. Um, and then you can imagine if their lifestyle has changed, that they may also have some psychosocial issues that develop, such as depression and anxiety. So we're not going to get into the assessment findings for Cole Pulmonale. We'll revisit this next week. So I'm just going to um, skip this one. So chest physiotherapy, remember I mentioned this a little earlier. Uh, cupping your hands, basically, you don't beat the patient up, but certainly it feels like you're beating them up because you're cupping and you're, you're basically um, doing that against their skin, against their back. Um, I don't know why it's fallen off by the wayside, but typically a lot of uh, clinicians, including respiratory therapists, are not doing it. However, it can help mobilize secretions using the vibration that you're creating to um, accomplish that. 
Other devices that cause vibration are your flutter devices. Um, so you might see some people use certain airway clearance devices uh, where the whole idea is to cause vibration so that these secretions can be loosened and expectorated and cleared. You can use postural drainage. Now, uh, we don't typically see this being done in the hospital. I think when I learned about postural drainage, it was really um, recommended for cystic fibrosis patients. Um, and you'll learn more about cystic fibrosis in pediatrics. I don't get into it, even though your textbook does. Um, but you may see that we are changing their positions so that we're trying to mobilize the secretions and facilitate them being ex expectorated. Supplemental oxygen. So you're all probably very familiar with the nasal cannula. Um, pretty readily used. We breathe room air at 21%. When you add one liter of oxygen, you're pretty much estimating about 24% 20, 20 of FiO2. FiO2 stands for fraction of inspired oxygen. Okay. So every time you go up another liter, it's about another 4% of oxygen that you are delivering to your patient. When you're doing your documentation, you are using liters per minute to document. But I want you to have an idea of what concentration of oxygen you're actually delivering. Okay, so we'll get into some devices that we don't use liters per minute. We actually use FiO2 when we document. Whenever you get to, um, especially liters per minute above four, so five and six, because we really shouldn't go past six, we should find another oxygen delivery device in that case, you should use humidification for anything above four. However, you can use humidification for anything less than four, especially if you're just trying to provide some kind of comfort, because one of the disadvantages of the nasal cannula is it dries out the nose the mucous membranes, people complain about how dry it feels. And so you may want to um, go ahead and use humidification for those individuals. The risk at higher doses without humidification is that you can dry the mucous membranes out so much, the turbinates, that you actually can predispose somebody to nosebleed. So it's ideal to use it above four. Other than that, there's not really many disadvantages to a nasal cannula. If you have somebody that primarily mouth breathes, they're probably not getting the benefit of the nasal cannula that, because it's going into the nose. So if you have somebody who mouth breathes, maybe a simple mask might be better. Okay. Um, you can get higher concentrations of oxygen, so where the cannula leaves off, the simple mask comes into play. You can get up to 50%. And the minimum that you should have your flow rate is six because you need to offset the CO2 that's going to be breathed from your patient into the mask. And then the highest, really, you lose all of its benefit after 12 liters. You don't really get any more of an FiO2 um, by going higher than 12 liters. So if you need a higher concentration, again, you need to find an alternative. People don't like masks, as we're well aware, in the social media. Um, and so a lot of people won't tolerate this. It's confining. They feel claustrophobic. They can't easily eat or drink. So there are some disadvantages of the, the simple mask. Um, but again, if you require higher FiO2 concentration, um, this is an option. If you need higher than that, now you're getting anywhere from 60 to 90% at flow rates of at least 10 liters up to 15. You really don't get any more bang for your buck above 15. And now we're looking at the reservoir systems, the partial versus the regular non-rebreather. Um, what you will find in the non-rebreather is actually when you pull it out of its um, packaging you will see only one disc um, on one side. So you see here, I have a picture where there's discs covering the holes on both sides on your right picture. 
um, they're not packaged that way anymore. They felt, I think, over the years that it was too high a risk of CO2 trapping. And so they have removed one disc, left the other side on. So now you will see the holes on one side where it will not be occluded by the disc. Um, a partial non-rebreather would be both sides are removed. So you have holes on both sides of the mask. Um, you get higher concentrations with, with a non-rebreather than you do with a partial non-rebreather. Dep it doesn't matter which one you are using. They both have these bags at the bottom. And what they need to be is at least two-thirds inflated. Because when the patient's breathing, the only way you're getting higher concentrations of oxygen is as you have the flow rate from the wall, not only is it going into the mask, but it's also going down into the bag. So when somebody breathes, they're pulling oxygen from the mask in addition to the concentration of oxygen that's accumulated in the bag. And that's how you're achieving higher concentration levels. So it needs to be two-thirds inflated. You never humidify this because you don't want condensation building up in the bag. That will displace oxygen. And you need at least 10 liters to accomplish the inflation of the bag and to really blow out the CO2 that would uh, be trapped in the bag. That's kind of the next step. If you exhaust the non-rebreather, now we're talking about possible CPAP, BiPAP, or uh, mechanical ventilation. So if you need higher lung, I mean, sorry, higher oxygen concentrations past the non-rebreather, now you're looking at more invasive, aggressive um, oxygen delivery. Venturi masks, don't ask me why. Maybe you're luckier than I am. I've never seen them in practical use. Um, however, they deliver exact FiO2 concentrations. So you see there's different colors here at the bottom. Each of these represents a different FiO2. I'm just going to out them off my head. Let's say the yellow is 24, the white's 28, the green's 31, the pink's 35, the orange is 40, so forth. So if you want an exact FiO2 delivery, then this mask is great because you can choose that. The others are basically estimations of FiO2 because remember when a patient breathes in, there's always room air that's going to filter into whatever device you're using. And that's going to degrade or decrease the actual FiO2 when it mixes with room air. Um, so these are a little bit more precise. Um, but again, never seen it used in the clinical setting. And I can't say why. So when you are using any of the humidification devices, um, I'm going to sh go back to the slide in a second. But you've got the trait collar and you have the pelican mask. The trait collar, obviously, somebody has a tracheostomy, which is an opening in the neck, versus the pelican mask, mm -hmm. which um, is a mask, but it's less confining because it has an opening at the top. Both of these need this setup where you have the sterile water in a container. You have a corrugated tube that connects to this um, end here. And then that connects to your, um, this all gets connected to the flow meter, but actually screws into the flow meter. You don't get to just put it on the nipple that's at the end of the flow meter. And when you document something like this, what dictates your FiO2 is this dial. There are numbers along this dial that will tell you 40%, 50%, 60%, and so forth. Um, and then, as you can see, there's an opening right here in the white section. So as the dial has a lower FiO2 of, say, 30%, there's a lot more of that opening that will show up. That's allowing room air to come into it and dilute the concentration of oxygen. When you move this dial all the way to 100%, 
this, all of these um, openings right here that you see will now be occluded. It'll just be one solid plastic piece. And that limits the amount of FiO2 from room air. And therefore, you're getting a much higher concentration of oxygen, which is why these devices can go from 24% all the way up to 100% for FiO2. And you still do need a minimum flow rate of 10 liters per minute from your flow meter on the wall. When we use face tents, oftentimes these are from oral surgeries, um, tonsillectomies, possibly um, maybe nasal surgery. Um, that's the most frequent exposure I've had to using the face tent. The trait collars, obviously, anybody who's trait that needs oxygen will get a trait collar that's humidified. Because, again, we're bypassing with a trach, we're bypassing the whole upper airway, and we're going down into the lower area, which really needs humidified oxygen. Um, other options that you may find, oximizer. Uh, which is pictured right here. It looks like a nasal cannula, but what's built in is a reservoir system in this plastic piece. So you're actually able to get a bit of a higher concentration using this than you will a plain nasal cannula. And you can go all the way up to eight liters and it does not need to be humidified. This, however, is a... Um, um, high flow oxygen device. Uh, you see it a lot being used in our COVID patients. Um, and it's kind of that last resort. What they found out with the COVID patients is they had a poor outcome once they got intubated and put on mechanical ventilation. So they were trying everything to maintain people's oxygen level. Of course, they were being allowed to be hypoxemic. So there was no other choice. Um, but they were really trying to keep them from getting intubated. And so they would use this high flow oxygen device, which does need to be humidified, but it blends this compressed air at very high liters per minute to, re to ba basically be able to achieve 100% FiO2 delivery. So you may encounter that as well. Typically, I'm seeing this more in the intensive care settings. You may or may not see it in the med surge settings. Um, it probably is dependent on hospital uh, preference as to the acuity of the patient. All right, so in COPD patients, we don't want to give them too much oxygen because that's going to decrease their drive to breathe. Um, basically, normal chemoreceptor response, our chemoreceptor response, we breathe when CO2 builds up that stimulates our respiratory drive. But that's changed in the COPD patient. Basically, it's now reliant on oxygen to stimulate their respiratory drive. So if we give them higher concentration of oxygen, the thought process is that we will decrease their drive to breathe. Um, I've never seen it actually happen in a COPD patient, but... That's why we use one liter, two liter to start them off. And we give them much broader ranges to be hypoxemic because they're probably naturally hypoxemic from their disease. So we're not necessarily trying to achieve 97, 98% SpO2. We might be happy with 90%, 91%, 92% in this population. If a COPD patient needs higher levels of oxygenation or mechanical ventilation, they certainly will receive that therapy. But as a rule of thumb, again, just um, start off low rather than high. Increase it as they need it. But our goals will be much different for COPD patients than other patients for SPO2. Bronchiectasis, we're getting into our last set of slides. Um, this is very rare. I don't think I've encountered any patients in my career with bronchiectasis. Um, what happens is there's a dilation in the, bronchi in the bronchi, and it's permanent. Um, and basically destruction of the elasticity and the muscular structures that support the bronchial wall occur, which causes the dilation. This allows microorganisms to easily colonize 
um, it allows you to, to pretty much set up a home there. Um, and so it's very difficult for these individuals to clear the mucus that develops. And so you'll see what that looks like, a normal bronchi versus the bronchiectus patient. Just really relaxed, loses its, its, its elasticity, and just, you know, mucus and everything else that's up there making it challenging for um, oxygen to flow to the alveoli where it's necessary for gas. Um, they will have a persistent cough, thick, tenacious sputum, difficulty breathing. You're going to possibly hear wheezes and crackles, may have chest or the pleuritic type of chest pain, clubbing, which is at the nail level, um, that changes over time with hypoxemia, or hypoxemia causes that change over time. Um, weight loss, and if they do have hemoptysis, which is bloody sputum, that indicates this can be life-threatening for them um, because of the involvement of the blood vessels. I'll let you look at the diagnosis. Um, and then I know we're going to go over time a bit, but we'll finish up with trachs. You'll get to practice tracheostomy care in your skills lab next week. Um, the tracheotomy is the actual surgical incision that's made. And then the stoma that is um, created is called the tracheostomy. Um, indications, if somebody can't manage their own secretions, if they need to be ventilated for some period of time, we typically don't want somebody on mechanical, or sorry, we don't want somebody orally intubated for more than seven days. They might go ahead and convert that to a tracheostomy that doesn't necessarily have to be permanent, can be temporary. Um, or somebody where we need to bypass the upper airway for some reason, they may end up with a tracheostomy. Maybe they have a head and neck type of cancer, like a laryngectomy gets done for uh, cancer of the larynx. They'll end up with a permanent tracheostomy. So there are a variety of reasons. Typically, you'll see uh, mostly the disposable kind of tracheostomies. The metal ones are not disposable. So if somebody comes in with a metal tracheostomy, it's usually somebody who's had it for a long time. Um, don't throw that tracheostomy uh, cannula out. Um, the plastic PVC-looking ones are the ones that are disposable. So this will get put in to the tracheostomy. The inner cannula goes inside of this. This can be pulled out and thrown away and a new one put in. And then the obturator is left at the bedside because if the outer cannula comes out of the tracheostomy, this will help dilate or keep that tracheostomy open. So that is used more in an emergency situation. The pilot balloon basically inflates this cuff, which is at the end of the tracheostomy. All of these outer cannulas come in different sizes. They might be referred to as like six shyly, four shyly, eight shyly. Um, and then right here, I see an eight. So that's the number for that. So if you're trying to figure out what size it is, it should be stamped on the flange of the outer cannula. These are the Velcro ties that are holding it in place. Um, because these cannulas go through the vocal cords, these patients cannot talk without specialized cannulas. Uh, the outer cannula for talking is called a fenestrated. It has a hole in the actual outer cannula. Um, typically, those are used for more established long-term tracheostomies, not the ones that are newly created. So if we cannot change the outer cannula to a fenestrated, then we can use what's called a passimere valve to optimize their ability to vocalize. And um, you can involve respiratory therapy as well as speech therapy to help um, patients learn how to use these And then you guys will get to do the cleaning and the care and the suctioning during skills lab. 
I'm going to open up to questions. Those who have to go, feel free, and it gets recorded. Um, I'm finding right now that Zoom is very slow to process the recording, so I am not sure how fast that's going to occur or how soon I can upload it to Canvas or share it with you. So at some point when that becomes available, I will put it up for your access. Um, I have a question. Since it's our first time in your class, what is your recommendation in studying for your exams? Oh, uh, that's never asked. That's such a rare question. Um, so I've put on, and I know it's not a study guide that you appreciate, but I have put up a study guide on campus. Um, how I would tackle it is first and foremost, I have taken, I've done all of the stuff from your book and pulled out the information to give you more bullet points in the PowerPoints. So I would probably start with my PowerPoints, sit down for an hour or so tonight. If you take a note, make sense of those notes, organize those notes tonight. Um, and then anything that is unclear, definitely go back to your textbook and reread those sections. Um, the other thing is I'd start doing questions sooner rather than later. Um, those questions can be, now some of you, I'm not sure, if you bought the textbook, I will show this to you. If you have the hardcover, on the very first page, there is a scratch off. That opens up an access code that you go to the Evolve website and enter, and it gives you the Evolve resources for this textbook. What is included in those evolved resources are multiple choice questions for each chapter and also case studies that are interactive for each chapter. And I would recommend using those. Um, additionally, you have the study guide to this book that is optional that you could find more practice questions and case studies. Um, you could do the case studies at the end of each chapter in this textbook as well. Um, and then, of course, you have the EAQ. So I've created practice test questions through the NCLEX EAQ. So I've picked the questions that I want all of you to answer. But you could go to, I would recommend going to the Lewis EAQ. Go to the chapter that you're studying for and create your own quizzes and answer those questions. When you go through the process of answering any question, read the rationales, no matter if the question that you got right or the wrong answer. Because even the correct, the ones you get correct, you may think, maybe you just off the top of your head guessed at it, you happened to get it right, but you really don't truly really know why. So embedded in the rationales are the reasons why an answer is correct or not. And that's where a lot of the learning occurs, um, is reading those rationales and trying to understand why are you doing something? Why is this intervention working? Why is this lab test preferred versus another one? When you come to these NCLEX questions, now this is another thing. Uh, bear with me again. For those of you who want to uh, leave, feel free. Um, it's not being recorded now, however. But this is on your Canvas site. Let me get to it first. Under Modules, and it's under NCLEX, it's under Student Resources, NCLEX Style Question PDF. Download it, share it. Okay. So what you see here is an algorithm that I've created to help you try to answer questions. Because when you get NCLEX cell questions, you're going to feel like a couple answers are probably correct, and you're going to have to figure out which one is the best. Um, so when you tackle these NCLEX cell questions, first and foremost, do you have enough assessment data in the body of the question? If you do not... Then you have to go to 
basically an answer will probably be some form of an assessment. So if somebody says, I'm complaining of pain, that doesn't give you much information. You don't know the pain rating. You don't know where the pain is. You don't know if they've taken anything. So there's a lot more questions you need to ask. So that means one of the answers is probably continuing to assess. So if you do have enough information in the question, I have my heart rate, I have my blood pressure, the pain is irrelevant, so we didn't even ask. Um, I have my oxygen level. I don't need any more information. I have everything I need to make a decision about what should be done. Now you're down to an intervention that you're picking to address whatever problem is being identified in the, in the question. So how to prioritize. Is it involving airway, breathing, circulation? Airway and breathing always take priority if it's an issue. If airway and breathing is not an issue, SpO2 is 95%, patients breathing 14 respirators a minute, they don't have any complaints of shortness of breath, but their blood pressure is 80 over 50, now I'm down to my circulation as the problem and the priority. Okay? So that's one way to prioritize. Another way, do I have a stable patient versus an unstable patient? If my patient is um, breathing at 40 times a minute and their SP2 is 85%, that patient's unstable. If I don't do something aggressive to intervene, they're going to continue to deteriorate, and I'm probably going to get to a point I'm going to have to call a code blue because I need some help to revive them. Okay, So that's an unstable patient versus somebody who is talking to me they say they feel short of breath. Their SpO2 is 92%. Their respiratory rate is 24. Okay, not normal necessarily, but not somebody I really am worrying about going into a respiratory arrest. I've got time. And so maybe I can do, okay, let's sit you up. Let's have you deep breathe and cough. Let's, you know, uh, go ahead and, and give you a... Um, instead of a spirometer to use. Let's give you an albuterol treatment if I have that as an option. So you see my, my therapies are much less aggressive. And then if you get down to these examples of stable, life and limb not threatened, unstable, life is threatened, or the limb is threatened, which means I have an extremity that's not receding blood. It's turning blue. It doesn't have a pulse. It's cold. If I don't intervene aggressively, they could lose that extremity. Okay. So those are ways to prioritize. And I would take this template and have it by your side when you're answering questions and see if you can start applying these tricks to answering those questions and to really prioritize which answer best answers the question which answer gets the most bang for your buck? Because remember, it's one and done. You, in most cases, have one answer, and then you're basically leaving that patient. So which gets the best or the most benefit for you? That's my recommendation. Any other questions? I have a question. I've logged on to the Evolve website multiple times trying to find the assignments either in the uh, med surge or the assignments portion, and I can't get the adaptive questioning to come anywhere. So is it possible they haven't been released yet? They should be released. Anybody else having issues? Katie's having issues as well? Yeah, I I have too. Oh, yes. They come out, was it 4 o'clock, I believe, at the announcement? Let me see something. I think I put that on a Canvas announcement as to when assignments will be released. Um, so the practice test questions get released today at 4 o'clock, which should be now. So let me take a look.
Okay, you guys are the September 2022 group. I am seeing it now. Thank you? you. Okay, good. So maybe it was prior to the, the release time? Because I didn't want you to do something that you didn't have context for, and that's why I've put time limits on it. No, that makes perfect sense. It wasn't there like three minutes ago when I looked, and it is right now. So thank okay, you good. for the verification. Good. Anybody else have a question? I, I have a question regarding the face dent. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it goes back to the PowerPoint that was right before it because I couldn't understand how can the face uh, dent get 100% oxygen if it's open on the top. Because the oxygen comes off of the sterile water because it's a different adapter to the flow meter, right? We're at a higher flow. We're at a minimum of 10 liters. And it's projected more towards the face. So the cutout's at the top, so there's less room air that's going to be um, drawn into the face tent, which room air is what typically dilutes the oxygen concentration with all of our oxygen devices. There's less of air that will be drawn in from the top of that cutout of the face tent. And then you have higher concentrations coming from the wall. Mm -hmm. Because that dial can go up to a hundred percent. Okay, so it's uh, okay. So by containing it on the wall of the mask, mm -hmm. it actually helps out. It was good to clarify. Just wanted to make sure it was yeah. like that. But yeah, no okay. problem. Thank you. Anybody else? I actually had a question going back to the TB test. Um, so with that, you said you needed three negative tests before you can be taken off of contact precaution. Is airborne it possible, or airborne, airborne precaution? Um, is it possible to have to test negative and then test positive after a negative test, or is is that are usually that's just less likely in some, unless something was contaminated or it got, um, I guess, mismanaged in the lab would be my guess. I haven't ever seen that necessarily happen. I mean, okay, I've seen blood samples contaminated, you know, where they're asking for a redraw because they're either hemolyzed or too diluted or, you know, they just weren't drawn correctly. But I haven't seen somebody test negative and then positive because there's not really a window for TB. You come in with the symptoms, and if you have an active TB case, you should test positive from the start. So the, the, the challenge here is the collection also. So if it's not collected properly, you're not going to be able to actually uh, grow your mycobacteria. If you can't do an uh, AFB, which is the gold standard, which comes from the sputum sample, there are the assays that you can do. There were two TB assays that um, can be referred to as reliable that were listed. Okay, so those are, um, do we need to know how they are? Or? No. Okay, so just that they exist. Thank you. And they can be much more rapid in its um, results than the AFB. We, we sometimes have to wait a while for that. So they may choose to do an assay for more of a rapid test. Kind of like if you think of COVID, there are rapid COVID tests now versus ones that take days to come back. Well, they, they actually don't take days. They just take uh, 20, 30 minutes. It's just the fact that they get sent out. Oh, no. It depends on the lab. <laughs> no, uh, Well, I'm talking because I, I would do it. I, and, and, and it depends. I mean, if it depends on the emergency, if you have an emergency, they're going to do it in the hospital. Otherwise, oh, they're going to be sent out. But yeah. even the hospital one can take 24 plus hours to come back. Uh, Depends. No. Now, you're talking your hospital, I'm talking mine. So, <laughs> okay. Now we're talking the distance issue. <laughs> okay. I mean, they use the same machine, but I can't remember right now because I'm not using it. But they yeah. use the same for and the it, for the. It flu. depends. Is it PCR or is it another rapid type of test? It PCR. Yeah. PCR. You just have to be careful not to contaminate because you have to be very careful with the gloves and everything. 
but we're trained for that anyway. Yeah, depends on the volume too. Yeah, you can uh, get about anybody? 40 or 50 per shift for eight hours sometimes. You guys are good. Talking about a hospital of 500 plus people where I work. Okay, anybody else have questions? Okay, so all of you will be starting clinicals. I had meetings with your clinical faculty yesterday. They should be in touch if they haven't already been in touch. Um, and then next week, you've got skills labs scheduled. Remember, our class is on Tuesday because of the Thanksgiving holiday, but we will go back to Thursdays after next week. Um, if you have questions about anything, please post on Piazza because I'm sure you're not the only one to have the same question. And I feel that everybody can benefit from the answers and the questions asked. Um, and you can do so anonymously. So go ahead and utilize that to your advantage. Um, I will monitor the site, give you feedback if nobody else is coming up with the correct answer to your question. Um, so you will get it in timely fashion. So nice to see all of your faces. Um, We'll stick with Zoom in the future. I know there have been some challenges today. Maybe they've been ironed out. Um, and have a great week in clinicals. And I will see you all again on Tuesday next week. Good luck on your first exam. All right. Bye. Thank you. You're welcome.